Today we're going to be talking about one of the most popular topics in artificial intelligence, machine learning, and data science, deep learning. But this isn't really my favorite name for this area. I would prefer to go with a more technical, uh, less hypey name like multi-layer networks, but maybe you would be less excited if I did that. Another possible name for what we're talking about today is neural networks. And the reason that they were once called neural networks is that they were designed to mimic what's happening inside a human or other animal's brain. That is, you have some neuron, and that neuron is connected to other neurons through synapses, and those synapses carry electrical impulses. And when a neuron receives enough electrical impulses from its neighbors, it itself fires and passes on a message to other neurons. And this biological motivation helped create a kind of algorithm that we'll talk about in a little bit more detail later on. But this connection to biology can be sometimes overdone a little bit, so we're not going to dwell on it particularly, but if you hear the term neural networks, think about multi-layer networks that we're going to be talking about in a second, and try to avoid too closely the connection to biology or things like that. Neural networks were once very popular. They were used a lot for all sorts of applications, from speech recognition to image recognition. And then, for about a period of a decade or two, they went away. Other techniques like probabilistic methods and support vector machines became more popular, and neural networks were less popular. But they came back in the last 10 years or so, and they have come back with a vengeance. They are very popular and in many fields are the state of the art at many important tasks like speech recognition, object detection, and increasingly in language as well. But the techniques haven't changed all that much. They're still basically the same underlying algorithms. While there are a few algorithmic advances, things aren't all that different. The bigger difference is that we now have more computing power and a lot more data. And these things together have made neural networks much more powerful than they were in the past on slower machines with less data. Within industry, these algorithms have gained a lot of prominence, and companies have been spending a lot of money to hire top talent that knows this field very well, and in some cases, like Jeff Hinton, created the field. This is true of the tech giants in both America and in China, and just about any company is now investing in these kinds of approaches because it's seen as an arms race. If you don't have someone in your company who knows this sort of thing, you will be left behind, and companies are forming research labs that focus on these sorts of methods. So what's all the hype about? So, the very foundation of these algorithms are functions that map inputs to outputs. And we can think about this in a pictorial representation that looks a lot like a neuron, which is why these are sometimes called neural networks. You can view a neuron as taking inputs from a vector. That vector gets multiplied by a set of coefficients that define the function. You take the dot product of the vector and that set of coefficients, and you feed that into a function. So let's take a look at this in a little bit more detail. You start off with an input. This input is a vector, and we're going to encode that vector as x1 through xn, where xn is the length of our input representation. We're then going to multiply that feature coefficient by parameters w. That you can think of as a dot product, and then we're going to add in some bias b. And so think back to logistic regression or linear regression. You typically have some coefficients and then some bias term that you add in at the end. This bias term encodes whether a function is more likely to activate if the bias is large, or less likely to activate if the bias is low. Uh, you can think about this as something akin to a prior. How much evidence from your input vector x do you need to overcome your a priori predisposition towards one answer or another? 
So this feature vector multiplied by a weight vector, add in the bias, then gets fed into some function. And so what does this function look like? We'll typically use some nonlinear function that has an S shape. So we can start off with, say, a sigmoid function, like with logistic regression. The sigmoid function maps negative infinity to zero, it maps positive infinity to one, and in between, it maps zero to one half. And so this basically takes really small numbers and maps them to zero, takes really large numbers and maps them to one. In between, it maps numbers between zero and one. You can think about this as taking an arbitrary real valued input that you calculated here and then passing it through some function that turns it into a probability. This is exactly what we did in logistic regression. So if this is the sort of thing that we're used to from logistic regression, why are we calling it activation functions instead? The reason that neural networks talk about activation functions is a biological property of neurons. Basically, neurons take inputs from a bunch of other neurons, and some threshold needs to be reached before they themselves will pass on that message to the other neurons that that neuron is connected to. And in biology, this is called an activation function. You have some concentration of neurotransmitters that need to be built up, and then you push on your own message. And this is basically a nonlinear function. You can have a lot of small little noise, and your neuron doesn't do anything. Once you pass the threshold, having additional inputs doesn't cause you to do anything more. It's basically a binary decision, but in between there's this odd nonlinear behavior in between. But again, this is exactly logistic regression that we've already talked about. So what makes this so special, and why is everybody talking about deep learning today? Remember, for logistic regression, if you want that to work well, you need to do a bunch of feature engineering on your inputs x in order for them to do anything useful. The magic and the promise of deep learning is that you don't have to do that anymore. You can let the algorithm figure out how to represent data in a way that makes sense and creates features or representations of the data that do a better job of whatever problem you want to solve. In a second, we'll talk more about how we can do this through adding additional layers to these multi-layer networks, or neural networks if you want to call them that, and we'll be able to see how new features get created. But before I do that, I want to mention that there are other activation functions that people use other than the sigmoid function. However, we're going to focus on the sigmoid function because we've already seen that for logistic regression and it makes things a little bit simpler, but I don't want you to think that if you're talking about neural networks, you're only talking about the sigmoid activation function. There are a number of functions that take really negative inputs and map them to basically some constant, and then they have some quasi-linear behavior in between, and some functions then taper off to another constant, or they're basically linear there on after. And there are various decisions why you would want to choose some activation functions over others. We'll talk about some of these a little bit, but for the moment, I just want you to know that there are other things other than the logistic activation function or the sigmoid activation function. Don't worry about it too much. You'll still get the intuitions that you need for multi-layer networks by concentrating on the sigmoid activation function, but we'll talk about the other options when necessary. Before we get into the actual algorithms for learning these multi-layer networks or deep learning algorithms or neural networks, whatever you want to call them these days, I want to pause a little bit and emphasize that these approaches are not magic. And oftentimes there are very good alternatives that don't have the computational complexity of these algorithms. For any machine learning or data science algorithm, you need to have good baselines. And you should consider baselines like nearest neighbor approaches, linear approaches, just to get a sense of, is the complexity of deep learning worth it? And in many cases, it is not. And often, the complexity of these algorithms sacrifices something really important. 
the resulting algorithms that you get out aren't interpretable. That is, if you show them to a human, a human has no idea what's going on. And we're getting better at understanding what these algorithms are doing, but simpler algorithms like decision trees or even linear models like logistic regression are often easier for a human to understand what's going on. And you need really specialized computers, often with specialized equipment like graphics cards, to solve these problems well. And it's not just one beefy computer that you need. To do the large parameter sweeps that you need to figure out the best possible configuration of optimization parameters and other things like that, you need a whole cluster of really specialized equipment to solve these sorts of problems. And that isn't within the time or monetary budget of a lot of people who need these problems solved. And, as I said before, even once you solve the problem, you may not understand the problem solution that your algorithm found. So to be clear, deep learning, multi-layer networks are great. You can do a lot of interesting things with them, and you can get really good performance on a lot of tasks that people care about with these approaches. But it is not magic, and you should often consider simpler baselines, if for nothing else, to compare whether the investment is worth it.